Muy buenos días. Dado que la profesora Susan Hack entiende perfectamente el castellano, hablaré, haré la presentación de Susan Hack en castellano, aunque no necesita, evidentemente, grandes presentaciones. Uh, dado que es una de las epistemólogas uh, con mayor reconocimiento en el mundo, en epistemología en general, no solamente en epistemología jurídica. Es un honor tenerla nuevamente en la Universidad de Girona, esta vez en un escenario muy distinto al que la última vez estuvo. La última vez que estuvo fue, si no recuerdo mal, fue en la defensa de mi tesis doctoral. Así que mi actitud era muy diferente, mi posición evidentemente era también muy distinta. Es un privilegio siempre escucharla. Uh, Susan Hack is a uh, distinguished professor in the humanity, Humanities, Cooper Senior Scholar in Arts and Sciences, and Sciences, Professor of Philosophy and Professor of Law at the University of Miami. Uh, una universidad muy importante, uh, una universidad que también uh, me ha acogido durante dos uh, periodos de estancia, en la que, eh, de estancia de investigación durante el doctorado, en la que Susan Hack ha sido... Uh, mi maestra, una de las grandes maestras de las que sin duda alguna he aprendido muchísimo de epistemología jurídica en particular. Hemos tenido la suerte en el derecho de que dos grandes epistemólogos hayan, uh, y se hayan interesado por los problemas probatorios, de Susan Hack y Larry Laudan. La obra de Susan Hack uh, en materia de prueba es uh, gigantesca el último de los libros ampliamente recomendable, sumamente interesante, uh, es Evidence Matters, creo que lo tienen por ahí algunos, uh, o hay algún, algún papel de uh, propaganda, si a alguien le interesa uh, conocer el, el, el contenido, el índice del libro, bueno, aquí, aquí lo tienen, no solamente cuando conozcan el contenido, sino que leanlo, a Susan Hack siempre hay que uh, leerla. El día de hoy viene a hablarnos sobre causalidad y específicamente sobre uh, la combinación de pruebas a efectos de atribuirle valor probatorio o efectos de la decisión sobre el valor probatorio de uh, ese conjunto de elementos de prueba. Nuevamente, un placer tenerla en Girona y su tiempo. Gracias. Oh, una pregunta. ¿Me pueden oír sin micrófono? Sí. Tengo un poco miedo del micrófono, porque mi acento es suficientemente terrible sin micrófono. Um, es un placer estar aquí otra vez, hablar con usted. Ok. Mi casa. <ríe> Su casa. <ríe> um, Empiezo en español. Uh, tengo que continuar en inglés, lo siento. Empiezo con una citación de Huell explicando el concepto de la conciliencia. Y entonces con ejemplos de casos en los que la cuestión del valor de pruebas combinadas fue explícitamente discutida. Las discusiones jurídicas de weight of evidence methodology, es decir, la metodología del peso de pruebas, son muy, muy confusas y muy, muy confundidas, pero de mucho interés para un epistemológico o bien uh, una epistemológica. Entonces, doy mi respuesta epistemológica. Por supuesto, el peso, es decir, el valor de una combinación de pruebas puede ser más que el peso de cada uno. La pregunta es, ¿cuándo exactamente y por qué? Después, dando algunos ejemplos, Desplago mi teoría epistemológica para responder a esta pregunta. Y entonces aplico mi, mi respuesta 
a ejemplos del campo de epidemiología. <laughs> una vez he uh, escrito un artículo con el título Un epistemólogo entre los epidemiólogos. Uh, mi esposo no puede <laughs> pronunciar el título. Lo que me permite responder a algunas preguntas a menudo, a menudo disputadas en corte. Y como conclusión, explique por qué el régimen Daubert, uh, es decir, el caso más importante sobre pruebas científicas en los Estados Unidos, tiene una tendencia de imponer un tipo de atomismo probatorio que es epistemológicamente indeseable. Y ahora, lo siento, en inglés. This is Hewell. The consilience of inductions takes place when an induction obtained from one class of facts coincides with an induction obtained from a different class. This consilience is a test of the truth of the theory in which it occurs. Um, that's Hewell. He is well known for his philosophy of the inductive sciences. <coughs> But I think he's better known because he was president of Trinity College, Cambridge, when Darwin's Origin of Species was published. And he refused, absolutely, we will not have a copy of this disgraceful book in the college library. His neologism, consilience, is not a real English word, or was not when he invented it. Um, stayed mainly within the ranks of philosophers of science until entomologist Ed Wilson used it for the title of his book, Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge. Un libro con mucho éxito. Um, creo porque es dos libros en uno. Um, uno con uh, un una tema muy ambiciosa y uh, un libro con una tema muy modesto, <laughs> incompatibles. <laughs> That's the secret of success. Write an ambiguous book. I can't do it. The question of consilience comes up in the form of questions about weight of combined evidence in a number of significant cases. For example, Oxendine versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceutical from 86. I've spread these over a long period of, of legal history. General Electric Company versus Joyner in 1997. Millwood versus Acuity Specialty Product in, two, in 2011. Here's Oxendine. It's a Bendectin case. Um, explicare sobre Bendectin um, en un minuto. The plaintiffs admitted a whole conjury of evidence, a whole pile of proof. And they admitted, take any one piece of this, it doesn't prove that this drug caused this damage to this child. But they claimed, if you took the whole pile together, yes, it did prove that this drug caused this damage to this, this child. Um, Bendectin was a drug for morning sickness in pregnancy. It was introduced not long after the thalidomide disaster. Um, ¿Se acuerdan? Um, el desastre de thalidomide. Oh, una droga terrible, terrible. Muy, muy... Uh, teratogenica. Uh, naturally, 
some of the children born to women who had taken this drug had birth defects. They had reductions in certain limbs. And many people believed, yes, the drug was the cause of these birth defects. And many plaintiffs sued the company. The plaintiffs offered an enormous pile of evidence on causation. They acknowledged no one piece was enough by itself. They insisted jointly they were enough. And in 1986, the judge agreed with them. Like the pieces of a mosaic, the individual studies showed little or nothing when viewed separately from one another, but they combined to produce a whole that was greater than the sum of its parts. That's to say, a foundation for Dr. Dunn's opinion that bendectin caused the appellant's birth defects. Eventually, however, Judge Terry was overruled, the defendant company prevailed, the defendant company prevailed in every single bendectin case, probably because they had a great deal more money and better lawyers than the plaintiffs ever had. Uh, I wish I could say, and by now I am certain bendectin does not cause birth defects. I can't. I have no idea. After 20 years of litigation, I don't know. All I can say is I hope it doesn't because in 2013 the drug was reintroduced to the US market. Okay. Then a Supreme Court ruling changed the landscape. This is Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals from 1993. It's also a Bendectin case. Um, Jason Daubert was born with birth defects very similar to Mary Oxendine's. And it was the first ever Supreme Court ruling on the admissibility of expert scientific testimony. After 200 years, the first ever. Under Daubert, federal courts must screen both for the relevance of expert testimony and the reliability <coughs> of such testimony. Reliability is new. Relevance is not. In screening for reliability, they must look not to conclusions, but to methodology. Whatever that is, nobody knows what that is. But since Daubert, everybody has a methodology. Mi esperto favorito es el esperto sobre como designar Yantas in Kumho Tire tiene una metodología. La metodología de inspección visual. He looked at the tires. Methodology of visual inspection. Henceforth, we hear a great deal about weight of evidence methodology. GE versus Joyner is a PC ca PCB case. What the hell is PCB? Polychlorinated biphenyls, a large class of man-made chemicals. Horribly, horribly carcinogenic. So carcinogenic that their production and their distribution had been banned for more than a decade at the time of Joyner. So in Joyner, the issue was not, are PCBs dangerous? No, it was, did they cause Mr. Joyner's lung cancer? Again, Joyner offered a whole pile of evidence. He admitted none taken by itself established causation. But if you took it all together, Yes, it did. The majority of the Supreme Court said, ah, too bad, um, sorry, um, 
The distinction between methodology and conclusions is not clear. No hay una distinción clara entre metodología y conclusiones. Gracias. Uh, and apparently, the majority of the Supreme Court accepted the defendant's argument. A pile of weak evidence is a pile of weak evidence. It doesn't become strong evidence because it's a big pile. Suggesting that courts, okay, the, the court suggested, court screening for reliability should not simply look at methodology. They should look at the analytical gap between an expert's data and an expert's conclusion. If it's too great, the evidence is inadmissible. They don't say what an analytical gap is, and they don't say how big is too big, except to say the expert ipse dixit is not enough. That the expert says so is too big a gap, but beyond that we know nothing. Then they looked at Joyner's experts one by one by one by one and said all were properly excluded. Justice Stevens disagreed. He writes a dissent or a partial dissent like this. It's not intrinsically unscientific for experienced professionals to arrive at a conclusion by weighing all available scientific evidence. After all, as Joyner points out, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uses the same methodology to assess risks. Indeed, the EPA's guidelines on carcinogenicity at that time specifically said we use weight of evidence methodology. Millwood, 2011, was a case involving a man who developed leukemia after being exposed to benzene at work. His expert, Dr. Smith, said he based his opinion that it was the occupational exposure that caused the leukemia on weight of evidence methodology. And he added, oh, and I used the Bradford Hill guidelines. What's that about? Okay. What does acuity make? Industrial strength cleaners. Um, do you know how the markers for whiteboards smell? Well, what they make is like that, only a thousand times worse. Okay. Very, very strong stuff. Uh, Millwood is remarkable in part for the appearance for the plaintiff of a supposed expert on scientific method. Oi, professor de philosophia, professor muy confundido. <laughs> ah, um, in mi opinión, un poco irresponsable, but okay. He badly confused matters by claiming what weight of evidence uses is essentially inference to the best explanation, which is a, a very, very ill-defined idea, which sounds vastly more plausible than it really is. He said weight of evidence methodology has six steps. Okay. Identify an association between exposure to this substance and this damage. Okay. Consider a range of plausible explanations. Rank them in order of plausibility. Seek more evidence. Consider all the relevant evidence available, whoops, and use your judgment to integrate it. What? All I can say is, this is completely empty. It's of absolutely no 
help whatsoever. Look, consider a range of plausible explanations. What range? Que quiere decir? Plausible. Rank them in order of plausibility. Como? Seek more evidence. What more evidence? What kind of evidence? Consider all the relevant evidence available. Okay, considering. Usa su juicio para integrarlo. Pero como? It tells, you, tells me nothing. It sounds very impressive and it tells you exactly nothing. The appellate court ruled, the trial court had erred in excluding Dr. T Smith's testimony under Daubert. It should have been admitted, the jury should have been allowed to decide what its weight was. All of which leaves me going, yes, but look, nobody, nobody has seriously tried to answer the really hard epistemological question at the core of all this. Can a bunch of pieces of evidence, none of which is sufficient by itself to establish a conclusion to the required degree of proof, do so jointly? And if it can, when and why? That's what we need to know. And none of these cases gets even close to answering this question. So here we go. I begin with the obvious response. The answer is obviously, yes, it can. And here are some examples which have nothing to do with the law, where it's perfectly clear that what's involved is a bunch of pieces of evidence working together. So there is evidence that many, many millennia ago, there was life on Mars. This is a big pile of little pieces of evidence. This piece of Martian rock, when you heat it, it has, contains little, little bits which appear to be just like bacteria droppings. They behave chemically and physically just like bacteria droppings. Well, combine that with there is this evidence that there was once water on Mars, and this evidence, and this evidence, and this. Yes, probably millennia ago, there was life, at least bacterial life, on Mars. Think of the evidence that DNA is the genetic material. Um, if you look at the work that established that, which is a series of experiments by Oswald Avery in 1944, you realize that what he's doing is combining. This is the result of that test. This is the result of that test. This is the result of that different test. Something like every conceivable test to distinguish DNA from protein, he puts what he's identified as the genetic material through. And it passes the DNA test and fails the protein test every time. But each of these is a separate, independent piece of evidence. The evidence for evolution. Okay. All right, if you're not well informed about the evidence for evolution, go to the University of California Berkeley's website, go to the biology department, click the link that says lines of evidence for evolution. And you will find, I believe the last time I checked, 14 different lines of evidence, 14 different kinds of evidence for evolution. Or think of a historian putting together documentary and oral evidence about what happened, say, in Germany after World War II. <coughs> or for that matter, Think of any criminal trial in which you have evidence of means, motive, opportunity, you get the idea. So of course the answer is yes. This is a very, very small part, an illustration of a very small part 
of the evidence for evolution. And so is this, a very small part of the evidence about DNA being the genetic material. I'm going to use the theory I used in, developed in evidence and inquiry and used in defending science within reason. And I'm going to rely also on the crossword analogy that informs this theory. Um, that's allegedly the biggest crossword in the world which you can buy from an airline magazine and no, that's not me. Sorry, it's a pity, <laughs> but it's not me. Um, here's in outline the theory with the crossword analogy doing its work on the side. How well evidence warrants a claim depends on, according to me, three things. Supportiveness. That means it's the analogue of how well does this entry in the crossword fit with the clues and the other entries that cross it and the entries that cross the entries that cross the entries that cross it? Independent security. How reasonable are those supporting ent entries independent of the entry in question? Okay. okay, well, it fits with this one, but what if this one is completely mad? Well then that lowers the degree of probability of this one. Comprehensiveness. How much of the crossword has been completed? How much of the relevant evidence do you have? So, um, I'm sorry about the English abbreviations, but um, I will get confused if I change them to Spanish. So, sorry, you will get confused because I left them in English. Um, a combination of pieces of evidence, which I will call E, warrants a conclusion, which I will call C, more than any component of E, E1, E2, E3, blah, 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 does, if and only if, when you combine them, the degree of supportiveness goes up, or the degree of independent security of positive reasons goes up, or the independent security of negative reasons goes down, and or it enhances the comprehensiveness. Well, of course, adding more evidence is adding more evidence, so it's more comprehensive, but it only raises warrant if the new evidence is no less positive than the old evidence was. If you apply this to complex evidence in toxic torts, it suggests Judge Terry, Justice Stevens, Dr. Smith were right, at least in this. Combined evidence may warrant a conclusion more than any other. Um, I'm going to look specifically at causation evidence. So, what kind of causation evidence do we typically see? Epidemiological evidence. Okay. Evidence of the study of this disease or this disorder in a population. In vitro studies, that means exposing cells to the substance in a test tube, in glass. In vivo studies, exposing animals to the drug evidence about possible <coughs> biological mechanisms. Ah, uh, well, it's this in the tobacco smoke that causes this genetic damage that causes lung cancer, for example. Background information about other possible causes of this disorder and relevant chemical, biological, etc., etc. theory. It also includes Meta-analyses of epidemiological studies, which are studies which put together many epidemiological studies and put them through a computer program, which nobody understands, and come up with an answer about what they show jointly. Um, it's very controversial because different computer programs have different assumptions built in 
and those assumptions may actually affect what kind of conclusion you get. And then there's meta-evidence about what's required of a good epidemiological study, a good animal study. Okay. Please use guinea pigs or rabbits or mice. Don't use chickens in your epidemiological studies because chickens are just too different from human beings. Okay. Then there's meta-evidence about whether studies were peer-reviewed published in good journals, funded by the manufacturers or by some federal body or et cetera, et cetera. And there's meta-meta evidence about whether studies funded by a manufacturer are more likely to be favorable to its product. Yes, they are. Evidence that this witness is or is not a repeat testifier. Um, some of the experts who show up in some of these big cases are ubiquitous. They've been in 15, 20 or more cases. They're saying the same thing. And if you explore their background, you discover they have a team of paralegals, but no laboratory. That's to say, they're professional witnesses. They're not really scientists, not anymore. Okay. You see, now, now we can see how combining evidence may enhance supportiveness. If the conjunction of all the bits of evidence and the conclusion makes a better explanatory story than the conjunction of one bit with the conclusion, the conjunction of another bit with the conclusion, and so on. And that depends on how tightly the elements interlock. Is it a better account? It depends on the <coughs> interlocking. So what do you want? You want the same terms to occur throughout. Same substance, same disorder. You want those terms as narrowly as possible in their description. So you prefer that the damage concern be, say, small cell lung cancer, rather than lung cancer or cancer. Right. Too broad. You definitely prefer the test animals to be similar to humans in the relevant respects. For example, I believe mice and rats have very different rates of, rates of respiration. And if the exposure is supposed to be breathed in, then it matters which you use because you want the animal closest to human beings. Whether the dosage is similar, whether the methods of delivery are similar. We can also see combining evidence may enhance independent security. Not because it will make any individual study better. It won't. A bad study is a bad study is a bad study. Right? Nothing you can add will make it a good study. But if, for example, you've got animal evidence and epidemiological evidence pointing the same way, the fact you have both makes the conclusion of both studies better warranted. Of course, combining evidence enhances comprehensiveness. That's a tautology. And that enhances the warrant of the conclusion if the additional evidence is at least as favorable as the rest of the evidence. So for example, suppose you have evidence of a statistical association between smoking and lung cancer. Well, we do. We don't have to suppose it. We do. All right. Worst relative risk known to epidemiology. Okay. 200 to 1. The risk, you know, the increased risk of developing scrotal cancer if you work as a chimney sweep. <laughs> well, I always tell my law school students, however bad the market for attorneys is, do not become a chimney sweep. It's deadly. Uh, relative risk of small cell lung cancer in people who smoke relative to people who don't smoke, 
roughly 10 to 1. If we also have knowledge of the biological mechanism, we know what the ingredient is that causes what damage, then the conclusion is better warranted. Notice, this is a theoretical analysis. It's not a decision procedure for weighing evidence. It's not a weight of evidence methodology. The EPA does not have it. What the EPA has is a section in its leaflet on carcinogenicity headed weight of evidence methodology, but it contains no methodological advice, whatever. Neither does Bradford Hill. Okay. Um, it does actually shed some light on the Bradford Hill criteria. That's what the courts call it. Bradford Hill never used the word. Um, Bradford Hill, Austin Bradford Hill, famous British ep epidemiologist, one of the first people to discover the association between smoking and lung cancer, gave a famous lecture many decades ago now, suggesting what factors to consider if you know there's an association, statistically, and you're concerned to decide whether or not it's causal. But that's the subject of an entirely different paper. You can ask me about it if you wish, but um, I shan't talk about it anymore today. That's roughly a picture of the material I used when I wrote the other paper. Be suitably impressed. Here are some questions which are frequently contested in court, at least in the US. Is epidemiological evidence of elevated risk essential to proof of causation? To which I reply, no. Look, well-conducted epidemiological studies can raise the warrant of a causation claim very considerably, no question. But if there aren't epidemiological studies, then enough evidence of other kinds might be enough. And that's important because in some cases, epidemiological studies are impossible. There is no way to conduct uh, an epidemiological study of electricians like Mr. Joyner, who worked on transformers like the transformers on which Mr. Joyner worked, insulated with oil like the oil in those transformers, to see how many of them get lung cancer. No way to do it. Right. And even if there were, I mean, even if you could conduct an experiment, it would be unethical to do that because PCBs are known to be poisonous. <coughs> If relevant epidemiological studies find no elevated risk, is that fatal to a claim of causation? To which I reply, yes, but only if they're good studies. There are good epidemiological studies and there are bad epidemiological studies. If they're flawed in a way that underestimates the risk, then no, this is not fatal to a claim of causation. For example, one of the studies on which Merrill Dow placed a great deal of weight uh, considered women who had taken bendectin during pregnancy at any time and did not distinguish the women who took it during the period when the baby's limbs are forming from those who took it before or after. That will seriously underestimate the risk. So that, that did not find an elevated risk seems to me to mean nothing. Is it acceptable to demand statistically significant studies and exclude those which are not statistically significant? No. Yes, it's true, the more statistically robust the study is, the more it contributes. Basically, the larger the sample the more it contributes. 
But first of all, statistical significance is a matter of degree. And the cutoff point for epidemiologists is a convention. Moreover, it's a convention made for very different purposes than the legal purposes. Very different. They're concerned we don't want to raise alarm unnecessarily. So they set the standard very high. The law is concerned with more probable than not. Right? Preponderance of the evidence. And that's a different level altogether. Um, I might say, it's ironic, but Bradford Hill insisted on this, and all the people who now cite his name as if he were God seem to have forgotten that he insisted on this. Is it all right to disregard or exclude animal studies? No. Of course, it's always a question, how similar are the animals? How well can we extrapolate from the animals to humans? But yes, they can contribute something. We should listen to them. Is epidemiological evidence of doubling of risk essential to proof of causation? No. Ah, this is a whole other paper, but um, think about it. People who imagine, in order to show specific causation, you need epidemiological evidence that the risk is more than doubled. What are they thinking? They're thinking, well, what's required is proof by a preponderance of evidence. What does that mean? More than 50% probability. Okay, well, if there's doubled risk, there's more than 50% probability. Right? Wrong. Wrong. This is a confusion of two different meanings of probable. Okay. So my reply is, no, this is not essential. <coughs> Suppose you've got a very bad study showing doubled risk or more. What does that tell you? It tells you you have a low epistemological likelihood of a greater than 50% statistical probability. That's not enough. Okay. And suppose you have a good study. Even a good study might miss a special risk <coughs> to some subjects. Maybe blonde women are more susceptible to this drug than brunette women. Right? Maybe older people are more susceptible than younger people. Who knows? Right? Uh, so if a plaintiff can show I belong in the susceptible class, even though the risk is not more than doubled, he may have a case. Can we infer from the fact that the causes of the disorder are unknown and he developed this disorder after he was exposed to this stuff that the exposure caused the disorder. No. Um, talking about inference to the best explanation, which is useless because nobody knows what makes an explanation the best explanation, disguises the fact, a very important fact, we may not know all the possible causes of a disorder. There may be causes we have not imagined yet. Do you remember Donald Rumsfeld? Does anybody remember Donald Rumsfeld except me? He was Secretary of State during the war in Iraq. Okay. It's clear there were serious, serious failures of military intelligence. In particular, the US believed Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. He did not, <laughs> though I think he did have the means of persuading his neighbors and his enemies that he did. <laughs> um, we were misinformed. Okay. This was a terrible failure of military intelligence. And Rumsfeld was inter interviewed by, you know, imagine poor Donald Rumsfeld and a room full of journalists like you guys saying, how the hell did this happen? This is, this is absurd. Right? It's ridiculous. What a failure. And he's trying to explain, you know, well, well, look, look, this is what went wrong. Look, you have to understand, there were the known knowns, well, the things we knew we knew. 
There were the known unknowns. There were the things that we knew that we didn't know. And then there were the unknown unknowns. And that was what killed us. It was the unknown unknowns that killed us. Why? Because there were things that were relevant that we didn't realize were relevant. Rumsfeld and the unknown unknowns became notorious, right? Everybody in the United States was just roaring with laughter. This is a, what's he talking about? Unknown unknowns. The man's wires are scrambled. I was the only person in the country saying, no, wait a minute. Um, terrible Secretary of State, I agree. I think he might have a future as an, epist as an epistemologist. <laughs> he has a point. It is indeed possible that there are relevant factors that we don't know are relevant. Those are the unknown unknowns. Finally, some legal argument. What Daubert did was to encourage courts to screen each item of testimony individually for reliability as well as for relevance. Okay, so this expert wants to testify to this effect, admissible or not. This expert wants to testify to that effect, admissible or not, and so on, one by one by one. To determine what, whether, by a preponderance of the evidence, it is reliable enough to be admitted. What does the punctuation mean? The punctuation means, what on earth does it mean to say, by a preponderance of the evidence, it's reliable enough? I have no idea what this means. Uh, this suggests a kind of evidentiary atomism. Look at the evidence atom by atom, piece by piece. Very clear in Daubert on remand to the Ninth Circuit. The Supreme Court did not decide whether the Dalberts were compensated. It sent the case back to the Ninth Circuit where Judge Kaczynski excluded each of the plaintiff's experts one by one. This one, not relevant. This one, not relevant. This one, <coughs> not relevant. This one, not relevant. Dr. Palmer, okay, you're relevant, but you don't have a methodology, so you don't pass the reliability test. Same thing in Joyner, where Justice Rehnquist ask, argued it was not an abuse of discretion for the trial court to exclude each of Joyner's proffered experts one by one. Notice my argument is not combining evidence always raises warrant. It's it may raise warrant. I'm not saying any old pile of weak evidence constitutes good evidence. I'm saying the right kind of pile, connected in the right ways, that does. But since it may, however the required standard of proof is interpreted, right, exactly what preponderance of the evidence means is a very hard question, to which I don't think anybody knows the answer, really. But whatever it means, it's clear that Evidence can be very, very close to that standard, and then one tiny bit more might make it sufficient. Okay. But it might be excluded under Daubert. That's the problem. Put it metaphorically, that may be easier. Just a feather might be enough to bring the evidence from not more likely than not to more likely than not. It doesn't have to be much if it's not far below that already. Some people will say, no, I'm being um, too polite. Professor Allen does say in print, judges who rule weak evidence inadmissible 
are averting bad jury decisions, or as he says, educating the jury. <coughs> I'm sorry, but I think this is a silly argument. Look, in the first place, they are definitely, you, know, you do not educate a jury by not allowing them to see certain evidence and not allowing them to know why you did not allow them to see this evidence. That doesn't educate them. It might prevent them making a bad decision, but it doesn't educate them. I can't educate my students by not telling them things. That's absurd. It might avert a bad jury decision if you believe a judge's opinion about the worth of technical or scientific testimony is likely to be better than a jury's opinion of this. Is that true or not? I reply, it depends on the judge and it depends on the jury. I don't believe there is a general answer to that question. Judges are also capable of misjudging the worth of combined evidence. My, my sense is they're more inclined to underestimate it and jurors are more inclined to overestimate it. But which of them does worse, I have no idea. I don't think there is a general answer. Muchísimas gracias por su paciencia.